If you have a Bible, go ahead and grab it, open it up to 1 John. First John chapter 2. Several weeks ago, I got a uh, message on one of the social media, Facebook or something, from a relative in my family. And he had traced the Richardson line back to a man named Thomas Richardson who was born in 1538 in Suffolk, England. Any of you in here big, like family tree, genealogy people, you've done some research, a few of you? I th- I've never done a lot of research, but it's always been intriguing. I've always wondered what, you know, my history is, the, the family heritage. What, what was it, uh, what, what was it like? Well, who were the people that came through? And, and I think sometimes when you start thinking about that, I think you wonder, what are some of the characteristics of of, that have been passed down, not, not just necessarily DNA, certainly some of that, but m- maybe some traits, characteristic traits. If you've been around kids for a while, it's interesting, sometimes you can see a kid and you're like, man, immediately you look at them and you know they belong to so-and-so, right? Now you see, like they got, you know, the Richardson hairline, or you know, like, they got whatever it is, like they got, I tease my wife all the time, like when our kids get very independent, I'm like, they've got the Frasier entrepreneurial running through their veins, like I can, you can see it, you know, and I don't know if you've ever seen people who have actually have pictures that go back and, and you can see like, it's kind of scary sometimes, right, you look at great, great grandfather so-and-so or great, great grandmother and it looks just very similar to this kid. But, but even sometimes, again, not just, care, not just like DNA, like facial or how we walk or whatever, but just kind of a part of who we are, the characteristics of who we are and how we pass those on from family, from generation to generation sometimes. And there's something spiritual as well. There's a spiritual connection that those of us who are in Christ, we've been called now the children of God, we're going to see today that that, that there, is, there are characteristics that we now display because we're the children of God. We're going to look at the text today and we're going to see in this particular text six things that, uh, that the author is telling the, the reader of how you can recognize and know uh, someone who is a follower of Christ. Now remember the context here. This is probably people... Um, the letter been sent to a church or several churches who are being um, attacked from within, that, that some people from within have raised up and are now teaching this heresy, and they've left the church. We saw that la- uh, two weeks ago. They've, they've, they've left the church, but there's still this turmoil of these people who were once one of us, and now they're not, and they're, they're claiming something different, and it probably was a mixture of Christianity and something else. You got to have Jesus, but you got to do this, or this kind of Gnostic we talked about, like this higher uh, learning, or it's, there, there's a whole mix of things that can, that can be happening. But I think the same is true for us today, especially living in a Christian culture, post-Christian, wherever, whatever term, definitely a, a, a culture that has in its recent past strong ties to Christianity. And you look around and you see things in our culture that is, is it Christian or not? How, how do I understand? How, I, how am I supposed to live my life? There are these people claiming to be Christian but yet living in a way that doesn't seem to match up and how are we supposed to navigate these rough waters? And I hope this morning as we look at the text that we'll walk away with just some examples. There's, there's lots of characteristics in the Bible I think particularly the author puts these here for these people walking through this difficulty. And I don't think that it's necessarily too far away from where we are in a culture that would call itself Christian but increasingly is not, right? And changing to something different. And it makes it difficult when you're trying to follow Christ. 
And you have other people telling you, oh, yeah, well, okay, I see what the Bible says, but you need to do this. Real followers of Christ do this, or that, that doesn't, that's not important anymore, whatever the case may be. And so I hope the text this morning will help us. I hope it will inform us and in how we can make sure that we are in the family of God, that when people see us, when people interact with us, when they hear our words, that they would immediately know, oh, yes, that person is a child of God. They look like their father. They act like their savior. They speak like their savior. There would be no doubt who our father is which family we belong to. So we look at 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 28. We're going to read all the way through 3, and then we're going to come back and, uh, and just go verse by verse and see the six characteristics in the verses. So starting in verse 28, chapter 2. So now, little children, remain in him, So that when he appears, we may have boldness and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Look at how great a love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. And we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So we start there in verse 28, and he says, see now little children. This, this little children we hear several times already in the book of 1 John, and it's somewhat of a transitional statement, somewhat of, okay, now we're moving on to the next one, but I just want to, us to remember and grab hold, and he uses this word over and over. This, is, this has special meaning for John and for his people. And he wants them, I think, not just to understand that uh, he has a relationship with them, but particularly here in this text, in the context of what's around it, that they are little children, that they are the children of God. And that's what he's going to unpack. This is, when you hear this statement, if you were to have read it from an apostle, from someone that, that you trusted, from someone who had been a part of of your salvation probably and a part of your discipleship and you hear him say to you little children this term of endearment and it's not it's not derogatory he's not saying oh you're like a little kid like you know you you don't mean anything. no he's saying you you're little children you are children we're going to get to that and then he gives them the first imperative here remain in him the first thing that we see as characteristics of followers of Jesus Christ is that those who are truly in Christ will have confidence when Christ returns and not shame. They live with a certain confidence or a, um, a certain, my, my text said boldness. And those of us who are in Christ have something different about us. He says here, you remain in him. That's the imperative. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. That I'm saying, listen, you are the little children and you are to remain in him or you are to stay in him. And the implication here is that you are already in him. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Now, this interesting here, the same word is used in 1 Peter, talking about the word of the Lord. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures or remains forever. And so it's this imperative, it's this 
command that John is giving these people who are calling themselves the the followers of God who are claiming to be little children, that they're in the family of God, and he's telling them that you must remain, you must endure forever. And when you do, as you remain, as you stay true, that your remaining in him is going to produce a confidence when he comes back, when he returns at his coming, that Jesus Christ is going to come. This was clear in the New Testament. These followers lived a life believing that Jesus Christ could return at any moment. And we've talked about this before. I think sometimes as time has passed that we kind of lose a little bit of that effect. We lose a little bit of that passion in us, that, that driving force that Jesus really could come back at any moment. Though it seems like it's been a long time in the course of human history, when you put it in the context of eternity, it's just a blip on the radar. And Jesus could come at any moment. And so he's he's giving them this command, remain in Christ, remain in Christ, because Christ is going to return. And you're going to have two responses, one of two responses that you're going to have when Christ returns. Either you will have a confidence a boldness. This isn't, this isn't like an arrogance. Don't, don't think of this word boldness like based on your own authority or based on your own uh, work. That, that's clearly not what the author has put in the rest of the book if you've been here for the rest of the sermons. If you remain in Christ, when Jesus comes back or when the end happens, you will have confidence because your faith remained, which the author has already told us, means that your faith is sincere. As we remain in Christ, as we give our life to Jesus Christ day in and day out, there is a confidence, not in our own ability, not in our own righteousness, but in what Jesus Christ has done, that we continue in him, that that tells us that the truth and the reality of all of the gospel is something we really and truly believe. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I don't want to really sound like a broken record. When someone who has continually and faithfully lived out their life for Jesus Christ and you go to their funeral and you sit there and you say, man, this person... I know that I am confident that they trusted in Jesus Christ because they remained in him. When we remain in him, it will also remove any shame that might be coming. I had difficulty, honestly, trying to understand this. It's like, well, you know, on on some level, we're all going to be ashamed, right? We're going to stand before the most holy God. And yes, we're going to be confident that the blood of Jesus Christ has saved us. It was nothing that we've done. But they will, we will also have deeds that we will be ashamed of. There will be moments where we haven't remained or maybe we've stepped out and maybe we feel bad about it. I don't think that's necessarily what the author is talking about. I think he's giving them two options here of when Christ returns. Either you will stand confident in the blood of Jesus Christ that he has saved you, he has rescued you, and nothing can separate you from that. That is truly what's in your heart because you have given your life to him. Now listen, I know there will be moments. There will be hours, there will be days, there may be weeks where we step out of that. And the encouragement here is to don't let that happen to you. If you find yourself in that place this morning, it's not just to say, well, I wonder if I'm saved or not. No, the call is, no, get your life right with Christ today and remain for the rest of your life. Because Jesus Christ is coming. And we'll either stand in the confidence of the blood of Jesus Christ and say, yes, God. I have confidence, not in me, but in Jesus Christ. He has saved me. You have been my Lord and my Savior. I have given you my days. I know that my faith is sincere. Or you will stand on the other side in shame. You will have no confidence. Because your life hasn't been proven as to be someone who has completely turned themselves over to Jesus Christ. Maybe you confessed with your lips. Maybe you said, yeah, I mean, I believe Jesus. And belief 
certainly is a part of our faith, but you cannot read the New Testament and not see that if there is a true belief, there must be works that follow. There must be a life of fruit. There must be something that shows that this is a reality that I truly believe, that I'm not just saying it with my lips or with my head, but I believe it with all of who I am. I believe it with my heart. And if we want to claim a Christianity but live our own way and do things our own way, then Jesus Christ is not our Lord. We will stand in confidence at the end or we will stand in shame. And the shame here, I think, is directly tied to the work of our lives. This whole context here is talking about works and deeds. And I know it's a difficult subject in the Baptist church, right? I... I, We made sure two weeks ago, I'm not saying that your faith is earned by your works. But the Bible is clear. If you have truly believed that Jesus Christ is your Savior and your Lord, then you will attempt to live your life as best you can for the glory of God. So that's what the author wants them to see. Those of us who are truly in Christ live a life of confidence in what is to come, not in our own, not in our own merit, but in who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us. Verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know this as well, everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Characteristic number two, those of us who are in Christ have righteousness as our birthmark. I know some of you are like, well, that sounds really weird. I know we don't pass down birthmarks, but maybe, like, I have, a, I have a mole, like, in the exact same place that my dad has a mole. I don't know if anybody of you have that. But I think it's really cool. I don't know. I mean, not the same birthmark I have because that would be really awkward. These, they're, they're, these, again, these characteristics that would mark us as being a part of something. This is if you know that he is righteous, and this know is, is an understanding of who God is. You have the knowledge that he is righteous. You understand that Jesus Christ, the God the Father, is completely, and right, completely holy and righteous then you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. What is is he trying to say here? There's lots of people out there who might be doing right. I think he's trying to get to the heart of righteousness. It's not just good deeds that are done. It's good deeds done for the glory of God. When you see and you know Jesus Christ's Righteousness of the Father's righteousness, it is what compels you in your own righteousness to do good. It is the source of which you do good deeds, the source of which you live for Jesus Christ. It is the motivation. Our righteous acts are motivated by His righteousness. Again, understanding that living for the glory of God is not to gain his favor, not not so that that we can gain salvation, but it comes from the righteousness that that is Jesus Christ that has been given to us on the cross. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him, not just these deeds of righteousness, but understanding that doing a deed of righteousness for the glory of God. We've talked about this a little bit. Anybody can do something nice. Anybody can take some of the things in the, you know, feeding the poor. I mean, Jesus tells his followers, they're going to come to you and say, but I fed the poor and I did these things in your name. And Jesus is going to say, apart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because these deeds that are done are not motivated out of an understanding that Jesus Christ is righteous. And if Jesus Christ is righteous, then my righteousness, I'm going to live my life For the glory of God, meaning my righteousness, my righteous deeds, and trying to be faithful to follow Jesus Christ because of who Christ is, because of his righteousness. See, that's different from the world. 
How can you know if someone's in a follower of Christ? Well, look at their deeds. Well, Tim, some people do some really nice things, yes. But are their deeds done for the glory of God? Or are they done for their, their own glory? Or are they done for some just because? When you hear me say, when you hear pastors say, or you read the word and you see these imperatives, how we should live. It's because we want to give the glory and the honor that is due him. It's not for our own righteousness. It's not for our own sake. He says here, everyone who does what is right has been born of him. In John chapter 1, I've been reading through John as we've been going through 1 John And 1 John is really just a summary of of the book of John. Like everything in 1 John is is in the, the, the gospel of John. He says in John chapter 1, But to all who did receive him, he gave the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. These characteristics... That righteousness is a birth, it's like a birthmark. It is like something that would say, this is who we belong to. Our righteousness, we're striving to live a right way for the glory of God. And that will separate us. That will show that we are a child of God, that we have been born of God, that there is something different. And then he goes on to expound on that. Verse 1, look at how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. There's so much in this one verse. We could have stayed here all day. Your version may say this love that has been lavished on us. There, there's some discrepancy here of, of this, uh, the great. Like is the great given or is the great love? And I'd say let's just put it in both places. What a, what a great love, and it's greatly given to us. The love of God is incredibly great. We cannot give enough words. I, sometimes as a preacher, lots of times for me as a preacher, you struggle with finding the words to really say what you mean. I think sometimes for us when we read the Bible, it's, it's hard. Look at how great a love. Well, you know, we use great a lot, right? Man, that was a great dinner. <laughs> or that, that was a, a great basketball game. Listen, that's nothing compared to the love that God has for us. And it has been greatly given to us. The Bible says in other places, the love of God that has been lavished on us. How do we know this? How do we understand this love that we should be called God's children? Tim talked about it a little bit earlier. That God would call us his children. We understand the gospel. If you've been in the church, you understand what the Bible tells you about who you really are. Right? Sin messed everything up, right? We were in the garden in the beginning. The kids learned this all this week. We were in the garden and things were good. And then the sneaky little serpent came, right? And sin messed everything up. And the Bible goes on later to say that because sin entered us, we became the enemies of God. That's what the Bible says. The sin in us has caused us to be enemies of God. But now, because of the great love that God has lavished on us in Jesus Christ. He wouldn't keep it that way. God wouldn't allow it to stay that way. And so Jesus comes and and God lavishes his love on us in the form of Jesus Christ so that we might now be called the children of God. No longer his enemies. We are brought into the family of God. We are his children. I know this analogy we start talking about children and fathers for, for a lot of us, for a lot of you, a lot of us in this room, just this difficulty with fathers and children. But this is the perfect father. If you could think about, the, maybe you had a great family and 
having your name in your town meant something. Like, oh, you're one of those, man, that meant something about who your family was. Maybe it didn't, it was rough for you, but you can, you can think about people that, that were a part of a family and immediately you thought things about them. Like, man, those people, man, they're, they're really great. Man, they're just, man, I would love to be a part of that family. They seem to love each other and their parents are so awesome. Exponentially more when the Bible says you have been called the children of God. You're brought into the family of God, no longer the enemy. You are the family, which means you are the heir to all things. I mean, think about this. Think about God as your father, the God who created all things, who who holds all things in his hands. That is your father. I know we use that term a lot, and I think sometimes, again, it can be very watered down. John wants to be clear, it's not just that we are called his children. Not that we're just given this name as though it's like a nickname. He says, no, you're not just called God's children, you are God's child. Let that sink in your heart this morning. I love my children. I love my children a lot. <laughs> and to think that God, the perfect father, looks at me as his child really should overwhelm us. And God would take us as his enemies and adopt us and bring us in as his children. This causes some problems. So those of us who are in Christ, because of this great love, we have a new family and a new identity. If you're keeping notes, that's number three. I skipped it. The characteristics of a follower of Christ is that we now have a new family. We have a new identity. We are the children of God. And that's why he says the reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. And this know is different than the know earlier. This is a comprehension and a comprehension and understanding of, of a reality that they cannot understand. I mean, think about this. Particularly if you've come to Christ later in faith. In, in, come to Christ later in life, how difficult it is for your old friends or people maybe that don't know Christ or knew you as a certain way and they see you now living for Jesus Christ and living for the glory of God, that just blows their mind. I don't understand that. That's how it's supposed to be for us in Christ. And I know some of us trusted in Christ when we were really little and we don't have a whole lot of baggage or a whole lot of background, but think about what your life would be like now if you didn't have Jesus Christ. You're living for yourself and living for your own pleasure. So that they don't know us. They don't understand. They don't comprehend the life that we try to lead in our righteousness, in the way that we lead our lives, just like they didn't understand Jesus. If you remember at the end when Jesus faces the cross, pretty much everybody abandons him. They just didn't understand they, they, had, they had no place to put a man who would come and live this way and love sinners and be with prostitutes and drunkards and lepers, but could also be with the religious people, speak truth to them in a way they never had truth spoken to them before. They just didn't understand. They couldn't comprehend the love that Jesus Christ exhibited to all the people around him. And that is true for us as followers of Jesus Christ. We are to live in such a way that the people around us are to be confused, to to not understand. I don't understand this lifestyle that you live. I don't understand that you would come on Sunday morning, that you would make Sunday morning church a priority in your life and gather together with these other people and sing songs to this God and read this Bible. 
I don't understand that you would come over to me and my, my next door neighbor. I don't understand that you would come over to me and help me when I didn't even ask you to. I don't understand how you could love me when I've done this to you. I hurt you and I said mean things about you. But the Bible says that we are to love our enemies. The world doesn't understand those things. And we're starting to see this increasingly more and more in our society. We're starting to see that living a life for Jesus Christ, again, remember, we have this culture that we're coming out of that is really a lot Christian, and it can be hard. It can be hard to understand who are the true followers of Jesus Christ, and that's increasingly becoming different in our land today. How do you know a true Christian? How do you know a true follower of Jesus Christ? Because they have a new identity. Verse number two, dear friends, we are God's children now. This is, this, is, this is the way it is now. You and I are God's children now. Let's just make sure we understand that before we get to the next one. Okay, this is declarative statement. You are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. You may have to read that one like several times. <laughs> I had to read it over and over this week. What, what on earth? Let's make sure we understand we're God's children now and what we will be has not yet been revealed. What's he mean? But what's coming is you don't, you, don't, you don't know. You can't understand. It has not been revealed to you. You do not know. This is something you don't know. What is coming for you? But when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. I think John is giving us a little bit of glimpse of what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns or when we go get to live with him. That something amazing is going to happen just when we see Jesus fully in his glory and all of who he is a transformation a complete transformation is going to happen it's one of those now but not yet moments in the scriptures yes we are a child of God and we're trying to live out being a child of God in this place but we're we're held down by sin and we live in this this corrupt body and something's going to happen when we see Jesus completely in his full glory something is going to happen this transformation that we can't even understand if he tried to reveal it to us we couldn't even understand it anyway something glorious and amazing is going to happen when we see Jesus Christ 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says for now we see dimly as in a mirror mirrors back then not like the mirrors we have like today they're like crystal clear like then mirrors you, it was a little more difficult it says we see dimly in a mirror like in looking in a mirror we see kind of we can see our reflection but then face to face, and now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. This then he's talking about is verse 10, when the perfect comes. When Jesus comes, then what I know now in part, then I will know fully. If you're struggling this morning, you're saying, Tim, man, I'm trying hard to understand and embrace really what it means to be a child of God. And I see that in the scripture, but it's so difficult. Let me... Let me let you in on a, a great understanding that is supposed to bring hope to you. That's what he says in the next verse. This is a hope for us that when Jesus Christ comes, we will fully understand what it means to be a child of God. I can't get up here and tell you what all that means. It hasn't been revealed. He says it has not been revealed But being called his children and understanding that in this finite way merely scratches the surface of what our relationship with God will be like after we see Jesus. This is why this is important. We have a hope for something greater. Those of us who in Christ live our lives with a hope of something to come that is more than we can even imagine. 
So what does that mean? It means that we don't live our life like this is the best there is to offer. How do you know if someone's in Christ or if they're not in Christ? Well, if they're living their life as though this world is the best they will ever get, then they haven't understood the gospel of what is happening in Jesus Christ. The things of this world are all you really hope for. And maybe you haven't understood the gospel. See, those of us who are in Christ have a hope that has not been. We have a hope that this isn't as good as it gets. Listen, tonight when we eat ice cream, it's going to be awesome. (laughs) Because we're going to put chocolate on it. And, I mean, it's going to be incredible. Right? My kids cannot wait to come tonight already. It's going to be incredible. Whatever you go eat, if you're going to take your wife out men today and you're going to take them out for lunch and treat them nice like you should, right, ladies? Like you take them to, you know, Red Lobster or whatever your favorite place is. Like it's going to be incredible. You're saving up to take that trip to Disney World or to wherever the place is for you, Paris or Alaska or wherever. And it's going to be incredible. It's going to be amazing and it's going to be awesome. John says, nothing will compare to what is going to happen when you see Jesus face to face. You will fully understand what it means. This salvation that we're trying to understand, we're reading the scriptures and we're studying. And I, I mean, I know it. I, I understand God died for me. I understand that Jesus Christ gave his life for me, but we still have this struggle. And when Jesus Christ comes, there will be no more struggle. We will completely and fully understand what he has done for us, and it will change everything. There's an incredible transformation coming that is far greater than anything this world has to offer you and me. And that's how you can understand. That's how you can know if someone is truly a follower of Christ. Are they living for this world? Or are they living for a world to come? Verse 3, last one. Everyone who has this hope, that's where I'm getting the word hope, this hope in this transformation, this hope in this in this future to come that is so much more glorious than what we have now. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, just as Jesus Christ is pure. So those of us who are in Jesus Christ, we really have come full circle. Those of us who are in Jesus Christ have Jesus Christ as our aim. So we live knowing that this transformation, this purification is going to come and it's going to become, it's going to come be full to its fullness. So we say, man, I want some of that. So I'm going to get on track and I'm going to start doing even what I can on this earth. Even though it won't be fully happening, I want to get the glimpses of that that I can. That's why we have discipleship. That's why we're learning and training ourselves in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ is our aim. We look at Jesus Christ and we see holiness and we see perfection and we see that is what's going. We're not going to be Jesus, but we're going to be like Jesus. We're not going to be God, the text says. We're not going, you don't be God, but you're, you're like God. What does that mean? I don't know fully what that means but it sounds incredible (laughs) and so if that's what it is then Jesus is my aim and I want to live like Jesus I want to be like Jesus as much as I can on this earth I know I won't completely get it here but if I can get glimpses of it if I can get tastes of it God can work in me and just let me see it a little bit here and a little bit there This process of sanctification, of growing to be more like Jesus Christ, it will help us remain in him. Jesus Christ is our aim. Why? Because he is perfect. He is perfection. He is holiness. He is the reason we come and we sing songs. We bow at the cross. Why? Because Jesus is everything. He is perfect. He is holy and he is righteous. And those of us who are claiming to be in him, we're claiming that he is that and we want to be like him. We purify ourselves. But we're already pure. We know that. We know that, Jesus, that when God looks down on us, he sees the purity in Jesus Christ. But it's this now, not yet. Yes, we are children of God, but we're still in this process. We're still purifying. Why? Because Jesus is our aim, and we know that someday this hope is going to happen. We're going to be fully made like him. But until then, 
I'm not just going to sit back and go, oh, well, I'll just wait till the big one, right? <laughs> I mean, I'll just wait till the end. I'll just wait till I get to heaven. And that's not what a follower of Christ does. A follower of Christ understands we're children of God. We understand who Jesus Christ is. And so we live in such a way that Jesus Christ is our aim. If you've been watching the basketball playoffs, I know I like to use sports analogies because they resonate with me. I know they don't resonate with everyone, but if they do, great. If they don't, you can think of your own. LeBron James, right? LeBron James, greatest basketball player on the face of the planet right now. There's been this discussion, right? Of, is he the best or is Kevin Durant the best or whatever? Okay, let, let's just put it to rest. Right, right now, LeBron is the best, okay? The, the dude's an animal. But what did he say? If you're, if you're watching, he see, who is he chasing? Michael Jordan. He said, man, I, w- I want to make a difference in the playoffs. He's already talking about the legacy of his career in basketball. Why? Because he wants to be like Jesus. I mean, like Jesus. He doesn't. <laughs> that would be awesome. He wants to be like Jordan. That would be awesome. Maybe he does. I don't know. When I was growing up, there was, we had these things called tapes, youth. And... Um, <laughs> There was this really popular song called Be Like Mike. I want to be, I want to be like Mike, like Mike. If I could be like Mike. Why? Because he's the greatest ever. We look at that and we mean, basketball, I want to be that guy. That's how it is for us in Christ. We look at Jesus. We look at the life that he's led. We look at the way he lived his life and, and, and the love and the compassion that he poured out on people and the holiness, and the character and the nature of who he is. We said, that's who I want to be like. I want to be like Jesus. How do you know if someone is truly a follower of Jesus Christ? They are striving every day to live like Jesus. I know this is going to be a weird transition But as I've been thinking about this text all week long and just thinking about these characteristics, I thought, man, this is what I want to be. I want to leave a legacy. I want, when I get to the end, for people to say, man, Tim was, he really was a sincere follower of Jesus Christ. Look at these characteristics of his life. And I know they're not at the end yet, but Danny and Lou Dozier are getting ready to leave. And I'm not saying that they're Jesus yet, like Jesus yet. They're not, they're not going to be Jesus. They're going to be like Jesus. I begin to think about these characteristics in the last 25 or so years that they've been here and the last 20 or so years that I have known them. And I thought, man, what? As I reflected on this text this week, I thought, these are those people. When I think about the characteristics of someone who's a true and faithful follower of Jesus Christ, if you know the Dozers, you know the things that I've shared today. This is what motivates them. I know they don't want me to do this, but I'm going to call them up. So Danny and Lou, I'm not sure. There you are. You guys go ahead and come on up here. I know you don't want to, but you have to. (laughs) You have to come up on the stage. These are for Danny. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Danny, Danny might need to hold them, though. They're pretty heavy. I just wanted to say thank you guys for not just your service here, but just the example of godliness. The example that you've been to me Over these years, I first met Danny and Lou when I was a college student. I can remember being in the fellowship hall and Danny teaching our Sunday school class. And it's just been a joy and a privilege for me to see them and be around them for these last 20 or so years that I've been here. And um, 
I'm so glad that we got to this text today. I don't think it was a coincidence. And when I think about people who have exhibited a life of faithfulness to Jesus, who have remained despite difficulties, difficulties in the church, difficulties in your own life through the good and through the bad, I'm so blessed. I count myself blessed to have been around you guys. And I think our church um, has been blessed beyond measure. And I know that this doesn't mean that this is the end. I know you're going to go somewhere else and keep exhibiting these characteristics. Um, but I, thought, I think we would have missed an incredible opportunity. I think sometimes we wait too late to honor people who have exemplified what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Um, and so I just want to say thank you, and I think our church would love to say thank you as well. So. Thank you. I hope Danny and Luke have many, many more years of exhibiting Christ, but I, I struggled honestly all week figuring out how are we going to end this thing. And man, when I, when I just, I just, Got to that place, I said, man, that, that's what I want to be. When I get near the end or towards the end, I want people to be able to say of me. I want people to say of you. I want people to say of us. They remained. They remained.